a very warm welcome to this next session, uh, which is a bit of a change of pace, I guess, uh, from the, the previous talks that we've been hearing. Um, so what we're going to be uh, listening to now is nine of our younger people, and each of them is going to speak for three minutes uh, on their PhD topic or their postdoc topic. Um, and uh, if you are any good at maths, then you'll work out that if we've got nine people speaking for three minutes uh, in a half hour session, um, then there is not going to be time for us to have questions at the end. But hopefully on each of the uh, talks, there will be an email address. So if you're particularly interested, you'll be able to contact the people directly. Um, as Bill mentioned at, uh, in his introduction, um, this is going to uh, be watched carefully and um, so there's going to be a, a small competitive element and um, so there will later on be a, a prize for the, um, the, the best presentation that's been made. Um, the abstracts for all of these talks, if you're interested, are in the handouts tab uh, on the right hand side of the screen. So if you'd like to have a look at that, uh, then please uh, feel free to um, to have a have a read of the uh, information for the background. Okay, so we'll move straight along, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, and that's Ivan Bokachev. Uh, so, so, hi, uh, uh, my name is Ivan, and my research is on the effects of surface hardening procedures on single crystal nickel-based superalloys. So the context of this work is the development of aerospace uh, jet engines. In the turbine of a jet engine, the already high pressures and the temperatures experienced by the turbine blades, shown here, are continually, be, are continually being increased in order to improve the efficiency of the engine. And these blades are typically manufactured as a single crystal of a type of alloy, which is called a nickel-based superalloy, which some of you may be familiar with with a microstructure that uh, looks like this, with, with a disordered matrix and ordered cubic precipitates in between, as pictured. Uh, and because of the increasing loading on these blades, the fatigue life of these single crystal samples is becoming a more significant issue than it has been in the past. Thanks. So a common way of improving the fatigue life uh, is by employing a surface hardening procedure. These are a diverse group of treatments, including mechanical shock peening, deep cold rolling, and laser shock peening, which are shown here. But in all of them, the, the surface of the workpiece is plastically deformed, which introduces a layer of cold work into the surface of the sample, and this is thought to impede the propagation of fatigue cracks. So in the near future, one or more of these procedures will become routinely used in the manufacture of, of the turbine blades, but as yet, there is actually little systematic understanding of how these procedures and how varying their parameters affects the single crystal material of the turbine blades. And that is what my research aims to find out. So to study the surface, uh, the cold work layer, I, I employ a micros uh, an electron microscopy technique, uh, which is called electron backscattered diffraction, which allows me to work out the small local misorientations in the crystallographic orientation of the samples, then by plotting these small local misorientations, uh, I can essentially obtain maps of the cold work in a sample as higher values of local misorientation, signified by brighter colors on the maps, indicate higher levels of cold work. Here, for example, maps uh, and the 2D profiles uh, are shown from samples obtained uh, for, obtained from samples which were treated by mechanical shot peening, deep cold rolling, and laser shock peening. And as you can see, we get a, a, a thin layer of comparatively high cold work from, from mechanical shot peening, whereas we get a deeper layer but of less, whereas laser shock peening seems to give us no bulk cold work at all, as you can also see from its flat profile. So this is a broad and ongoing work, uh, and here are some more of my results. But in the end, we hope to be able to optimize the cold work layer at the sample surface and therefore obtain the best improvement in the fatigue life of these blades. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, so we'll be moving 
on immediately uh, to our next speaker, and that's Nicole Church. Hi, so I'm Nicole and I'm looking at superelastic alloys for vibration damping applications. Now, mechanical vibrations, particularly those in rotating components, are a major problem in aerospace as they cause and accelerate component fatigue and eventually lead to failure. Now, superelastic alloys have potential to absorb these vibrations by exploiting a reversible martensitic transformation. However, their use is currently limited due to large variations in the temperature range over which this behavior is stable. Now, the thermal transformation between the beta and alpha double prime Martin site occurs at our Martin site start temperature, MS, which is approximately 20 degrees below the intersection of the free energy curves to provide a thermal driving force for the transformation. However, this can also be stress driven. Now, this intersection is thought to solely depend on composition. Hence, we use composition to tailor the behavior of our materials to specific applications. However, in the literature, widely different values of MS have been reported even for the same alloy. Now, a number of things could account for this variation, such as grain size, specimen dimensions, loading conditions and sample preparation, none of which are well controlled or reported within the literature. So my work looks at isolating these various effects to see if we can rationalize the behavior of these alloys and ultimately make the behavior more predictable. Now, material is usually heated to high temperatures to favor the beta phase and produce a consistent microstructure. So one effect I've investigated is cooling rate from these high temperatures with three different rates shown here. Slower rates result in a retained beta microstructure. However, the fastest rate is beta plus martensite with the needles of alpha double prime visible in the microstructure. So cooling rate is having a pronounced effect on our material, and this could account for some of the variability within the literature. Now, if we consider heating and cooling a slowly cooled sample, we see no evidence of any transformation. However, if we run the same test on a rapidly cooled sample, we see a reverse transformation on heating, which makes sense as we start with some martensite and heating favors the beta phase and so our alloy transforms. However, we also see a transformation on cooling, and this is despite cooling rates for the test being very slow, meaning our initial rapid cooling from high temperatures is influencing our behavior even after returning to an entirely beta phase. So our results show that rapid cooling promotes a martensitic structure and that this persists even after heating. Now, this can only be accounted for by considering internal stresses within the material, which were generated during rapid cooling. Now, the effect of internal stress hasn't really been considered until recently, as it was thought to be negligible compared to the thermal and mechanical driving forces that we can apply externally. This means that by more consistent sample preparation, we can reduce the wide variation in temperature stability seen in the literature, which has previously meant these alloys were unusable. And therefore, by consideration and appreciation of internal stresses, these materials may play a role in the future vibration damping components in the aerospace industry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicole. Uh, so our next, next speaker is um, Adarsh Kanyur. Hi, I'm Adarsh Kanyur. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher in uh, Macromolecular Materials Laboratory led by Professor James Elliott. My research focuses on developing carbon nanotube spaced ultimate materials for weight critical applications like high strength and lightweight electrical cables. In today's presentation, I will introduce our new high Q production method and discuss how the application of statistical principles has helped us improve this process substantially. Next. Carbon nanotubes are tiny tubular structures made entirely of carbon. They come in several different structural forms and have extraordinary properties in the nanoscale. To harness these properties at practical length scales, the one, one way is to assemble them hierarchically into bigger structures known as fibers or yarns as shown here. Next. The Cambridge direct spinning process is a single step method of making aligned CNT fibers, which was developed in our group way back in 2004. Today, the process stands literally as a multi-story giant reactor in our laboratory, capable of making nanotubes in a one single step from gaseous precursors, just like making candy floss. The challenge before us is to increase the throughput and the quality of CNT fibers produced. Next. My recent achievement was the development of these one-thought recipes of precursors, 
not to be confused with iron brew, which when combined with the right growth conditions produces nanotubes of predefined quality. For example, when combined with high flow rate conditions, nanotubes that are defect free, metallic and single walled can be obtained. This method also improves the yield by up to three times. Next, yes. We were now interested in mapping the entire multifactorial production space of this process. Following the UDA problem solving method, we performed thousands of experiments, employed design of experiments, and also performed extensive material characterizations. The result is that we are able to model and predict fairly well material properties such as specific electrical conductivity. As an example, the model shown on the right predicts specific electrical conductivity of 1900 to 6000 specific units, which is very close to that of copper. And this can be achieved by controlling reactor parameters such as hydrogen flow, precursor concentrations, and winding rate. Can this be achieved? Uh, previous slide, please. Can this be achieved uh, experimentally? Yes. We have already shown that by adding an extra aligning step, we can get specific conductivities of 1600 units, which is very close to that of the predicted value. In future, by application of green and AI based production uh, methods, I believe this number can be further improved and increased beyond that of copper. Next. As a conclusion, I would like to say that carbon nanotubes, unlike most materials, are simultaneously strong, conductive, and lightweight. This means that in terms of a multifunctional metric known as the Uber parameter, which combines both strength and electrical conductivity, carbon nanotubes are right at the top and beat most benchmark materials. As you can see, our cable CNT materials are at the top here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adash. So our next speaker is Nevis uh, Struckel. Hello, I'm Nevis Struckel. Um, I'm a postdoctoral researcher working on designing oxide heterostructures for superior resistance switching, working together with a large team led by Professor Judith Driscoll and Dr. Juliana Di Martino. Our society is becoming increasingly data hungry. We are generating and storing more and more data and thus also consuming increasing amounts of electricity. It is forecasted that by the end of this decade, we will be using more than 20% of the world's energy consumption just on storing uh, and processing data. Such huge energy demands or electricity demands cannot be met by the standard devices. So we are exploring a new device paradigm in which we can combine memory and computing into a single device cell. These cells are called resistive switching devices. And here one can store uh, memory bits by uh, tuning the resistance of a cell. A typical cell consists of an insulating layer sandwiched between two metallic electrodes and in the realization that I'm exploring, one uses a charge distribution to store this memory bit. There are two common ways to store the charge distribution in a memory device, and that is either by using ionic conduction, which is present to some extent in all insulating layers, where a microscopic motion of defects causes this charge distribution, or by using a rather narrow class of materials that are ferroelectrics, where one has a spontaneous charge separation in these materials on a unit cell level and is inter intrinsically interfacial. Ferroelectric materials have many advantages. That is, they are more energy efficient and are better when integrating these cells into a chip. But one cannot study ferroelectric materials without considering ionic conduction. That is, they're always linked. So the environment caused by ionic conduction in ferroelectrics will affect their ferroelectricity and vice versa. So in my previous studies, I have looked into how ferroelectricity um, changes under the influence of the charge within the environment, and that is it can lead to a cancellation of ferroelectricity, suppression, suppression or enhancement. And now I have realized that one really needs to study these two effects in parallel. So what I am currently doing is to try to find a balance between ionic conduction and ferroelectricity by tuning the composition or the epitaxial strain within the insulating layer, or by changing the metal insulator pair of this resistive switching cell. And to be able to find the synergy of these two effects, we are using an optical operando approach, uh, which was uh, discovered in the group of Dr. Giuliano Di Martino, when one looks at the optical spectra of the resistive switching device during the switching process, and then links this to the charge distribution within the layer. We are hoping that with this approach, we can reach our end goal of producing more energy efficient devices and thus tame our uh, electricity drive. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Nima. And our next speaker is Liam Ives. Hello, my name is Liam Ives, and I'm a second year PhD student in the Device Materials Group, supervised by Dr. Shimi Kanarayan. My research is about developing thin, conformable, and robust force sensors to enable precision joint replacement surgery, such as in the hip and knee. First, let me introduce the problem. We have a population that is not only aging, but is more active as well, which means that we're placing more and more stress on our joints. Furthermore, the average age of a person receiving a joint replacement is actually de decreasing. As a result, the number of joint replacements is increasing. Uh, and in the United Kingdom, about 2 million hip and 1.5 million knee replacements were performed between 2003 and 2019. Uh, and this leads to greater burden on surgeons who have to not only perform more surgeries, but have to ensure that the replacements last longer than they ever have before. Uh, during hip replacement, it's crucial that the forces on the joint are balanced to avoid localised forces and wear on one part of the joint, which could cause the patient a lot of pain and the requirement for further surgery. For, uh, currently, this force balancing depends entirely on surgical skill, as there's currently no technology that can give surgeons information on these forces in the hip joint, because the joint is small and has a complex geometry. So to solve this unmet clinical need, we've invented a thin and flexible force sensor that can fit into the hip joint and conform to its complex surface. Uh, the sensor itself is based on microfluidics, which is the movement of tiny amounts of fluid in submillimeter sized channels. As the force is applied to a reservoir that contains fluid, the fluid is displaced along the channel, as you can see in the animation. The fluid overlaps with the electrodes, which changes their capacitance. So if we can measure the capacitance when an unknown load is applied, we can work out the force. And we use a combination of aerosol jet printing and 3D printing to manufacture the sensors, which allows them to be rapidly prototyped and customised. To test their ability to work in the hip joint, we designed and made a model of the trial insert, which is the part of the implant that the sensors will be located in during surgery. Uh, the hip joint is a ball and socket joint, and the trial insert forms part of the socket or the cup part of the implant, and we produce this trial insert using 3D printing. To represent the surgeon applying a force to the joint during a hip replacement, we designed a custom-made mechanical testing rig to house the trial insert. We then applied a range of different forces at a range of different angles to determine whether the sensors responded in the way that we expected from some finite element simulations that we made. In conclusion, these sensors are operational up to a similar range of forces applied by surgeons during hip replacements. These sensors should then be able to guide the surgeons when positioning the implant during surgery. Uh, and in the future, it's thought that these sensors could be adapted for many different applications, including other joints. Uh, if you're interested in finding out a bit more, please send me an email or, or come check out my poster. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Liam. And our next speaker is Christina Bukovala. Hi, everyone. I am Christina Bukovala, a third year uh, PhD student in the Optical Nanomaterials Group. And today I will talk to you about the potential of uh, plasmonic magnesium nanoparticles to interact with light. Plasmonic nanoparticles can be exploited for a variety of applications ranging from arts and catalysis to point of care devices, single molecule detection, and even cancer therapy. Now, all these applications take advantage of phenomena that occur due to the same mechanism, that is the ability of the plasmonic nanoparticles to interact with light and sustain resonant coherent oscillations of the electron cloud. These oscillations are known as surface, as a localized surface plasma resonances, or in short, LSPRs, and depend highly on nanoparticle parameters such as material, shape, or size. Now, in terms of material, the most common plasmonic metals include gold, silver, copper, aluminium, and very recently magnesium. On the left, we plot as a function of wavelength the plasma quality uh, factor of these materials as well as the sun's spectral irradiance. We can see that for most of the visible rind that's light that is roughly between 400 and 700 nanometers, magnesium in the blue line is actually the second best option after silver, making it a very good candidate for uh, sunlight-driven plasmonic applications. Now, on top of that, magnesium is earth abundant, is cheap, is a very good candidate for biocompatibility given that magnesium is a key human nutrient, it does suffer from oxidation issues, but this is the case for most of the other plasmonic metals. And finally, it crystallizes in a hexagonal closed cut structure that is very different to the other cubic metals and therefore gives rise to um, unique nanoparticle shapes. 
Now, to model these uh, shapes, we take into account magnesium's hexagonal symmetry and its various twin planes, some of which you can see here. We use our nanoparticle shape modeling tool to demonstrate not only single crystal structures like the hexagonal plate, but also an array of single twin uh, nanoparticle shapes that we name tent, chair, taco, and kite. And these picnic themed shapes explain uh, why well the nanoparticles we have seen in uh, colloidal synthesis. Now, in order to investigate the plasmonic properties of these shapes, we employ electromagnetic computational techniques and we describe the shape-dependent resonant plasmonic modes of the various shapes, and we show that these exhibit strong localized electric fields that are crucial for applications such as catalysis. Finally, we demonstrate that we can tune the LSPRs across the visible range by changing parameters such as the size or the aspect ratio of these um, nanoparticle shapes. To summarize, we have shown that magnesium forms unique nanoparticle shapes, with competitive and tunable plasmonic properties. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Christina. So our next speaker is Kieran Richards. Uh, good afternoon, uh, I'm Kieran Richards. Uh, I'm a third year PhD student, and I'm gonna to talk to you about my work on light responsive pickering emulsions. So our uh, next slide. Um, so a pickering emulsion is a mixture of oil, water, and some specialized solid particles. And when you shake this mixture, you form these droplets. Now in real life, you can see in the bottom left, you get these two layers and then you get emulsification and you get one layer. Uh, and under a microscope, these are very small and you can see the droplets. Next. Uh, so the applications for these, there are a few. You can use them as micro reactors. You can do reactions inside the droplets. You can use them for molecular storage. So you can take something which is, you know, uh, sensitive to the environment, for instance, mRNA, uh, topical right now with the uh, vaccines. Uh, and they have to be stored at, you know, a very low temperature. Well, if you could encapsulate it, then you could store it at a higher temperature. And then drug delivery. So, you know, getting drugs inside the body, whether that be topically or orally. Um, so the idea here is that we're taking our payload. We are loading up a droplet. We are transporting that. Uh, and then you can do a reaction on it if you want to, and then you would release your product. Um, the thing is that um, you have to physically break open the particles, and that uses some sort of attrition, which damages them. Uh, a better option, uh, next slide, is to use light. Uh, here, you can shine light on the droplets, uh, and it is released without you having to touch them. Now, the way we do this is by modulating something called the hydrophobicity. So um, if you add a particle to an oil-water mixture, one of three things will happen. If it's like this oil loving type, it will go into the oil. If it's water loving, it will go into the water. And if it's this in between the two, um, then it's at the interface. And this is what we want to form a Pickering emulsion. So what we do is we take um, these particles and we graft what is known as a photo switch to the surface. Now this changes between two states, uh, depending on the color of the light you shine on it. And you can see here that it goes between an oil loving state to one of these in-between states that forms a Pickering emulsion. So next slide, please. Uh, so a Pickering emulsion, we did this, and you see that we go from an emulsion, one layer, to two layers when we shine blue light on it. Uh, and again, in the microscopy images, you can see these nice little droplets going to nothing. And then on the right-hand side, you can see that we have these uh, 100 micrometer droplets, and then obviously going to zero when you de-emulsify your emulsion. Um, so, in conclusion, what I want to say is that uh, if you think about these applications I told you about earlier, so microreactors, except now we can separate the products just using light. Uh, molecular storage, except we can store things and separate them using light. Or drug delivery, where we can take drugs and then we can shine light on a particular part of the body and release the drugs just in that part of the body. So uh, with that, thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Kieran. And our next speaker is Elsa Ellerman. All right, so I'm uh, Elsa, a third year PhD student focusing on bone tissue engineering. So with the aging society, we have an increased incidence of large bone fractures that do not heal properly. So in order to improve this, we try to provide a framework to which cells can then comfortably attach to regenerate the patient's own tissue. A challenge, however, with this is trying to uh, establish a blood vessel network that uh, goes into the framework to provide nutrients to the cells. So a lot of research tries to improve this. Uh, by trying to improve the cell attachment. So the first thing that happens once you put a biomaterial into the body is that a protein layer attaches to it, which has cell binding sites. So this is essentially what the cells see. So if you want to modulate this attachment, 
you can uh, change the biomaterial. A lot of research has gone into uh, the influence of physical properties, but not so much on the electrical chemical properties, which is what my project will focus on, and in particular, the nanoscale potential variations. Next. The problem with nanoscale potential variations, however, is what you can see on the right, is that there is a less negative charge directly on the crane boundary. So it entirely overlaps with the crane crane boundary structure. So if on the left, you can see that there's two um, surfaces with different topographies because of the cranes, there's also a difference in the potential variations. So um, in order, it's not clear which of these properties is actually influencing your results. So next. So we try to create a setup to deconvolute these properties. So first we have, we have a set that we polish and scratch to reduce the differences in topography, but keep the differences in potential. Uh, and on the right, we have a set that we coat with a cold coating to uh, keep the differences in topography, but remove the electrical chemical differences. Next. So if you then assess this on surfaces with hydroxyapatite having a larger crane and silicon substituted HA having a smaller cranes and this increased potential nanoscale potential variations, we find that there is more blood vessel formation on silicon HA and a more complex network. If you then assess it on the polished and scratch samples, we still see that there is more blood vessel formation on silicon HA. So there must be something other than topography that is influencing this. And initially we thought this was because of the increased potential variations that reduces the repulsion between the uh, protein and the charge that is found at the crane boundary that thus increases the protein attachment. But if you then go to the protein attachment assay on the PS samples, we see that there is actually a similar protein attachment. So there must be something else that's influencing this. So right now we're trying to assess whether it's potentially the protein conformation that's simply changing or is a direct effect of the silicon through ion dissolution. Trying to get to the bottom of these mechanisms is really essential for us to improve the cell attachment uh, in the future and there with blood vessel formation to improve tissue engineering in the future. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Elsa. And our final talk is from Chuck Witt. Oh, all right. Thanks so much, Serena. Uh, I'm Chuck, a member of the Materials Theory Group in the department, and I'm looking forward to telling you about predicting crystal structures from first principles efficiently. Next, please. So I'll start by introducing a tool, a computational tool that we use a lot in the Materials Theory Group when we want to know what crystal structures a group of atoms prefers, but we don't know at all. And this is random structure searching. We start with a set of random structures um, generated so that they're not don't have atoms on top of each other or atoms very far away, but otherwise completely random. Then one by one, we optimize these structures using some technique that I'll explain a bit more soon. And in doing so, you know, do it once, you don't want very much, but do it thousands or tens of thousands of times, and you start to build a picture of the energy landscape of stable or metastable structures. Uh, next, please. So as a quick example, I want to highlight some work from coworkers in the group who really care a lot about battery materials, in particular lithium ion cathode materials. And they recently, in the work outlined on the bottom right, and also there's a poster by Ziheng Liu on this work if you're interested, but they recently put forth a computational framework for identifying promising materials of this kind. They started with random structure searching. So the energy landscape here is a slightly more complicated version of the one from the previous slide, but you can see the light colored squares are the initial random structures, which relax or are optimized into the local minima represented by the dark colored squares. Next. Once this process is completed, uh, these workers pulled out the stable structures, did a little bit more analysis to see which ones might be synthesizable. And then in a third step, uh, looked at their uh, properties to see if they would be promising materials for battery cathodes. A really nice piece of work. Yeah, thanks. So we'll take a step back now and I'll talk some about my work in particular. And, and looking at the schematic that describes the structure switching process, we want to ask the question, what properties should this optimizer have, have that takes a random structure and brings it to a stable structure? Well, first, because we're feeding it in lots of crazy structures initially, not just locally stable structures, we need it to be accurate across a wide range of possibilities. It needs to be a quantum mechanical method for that reason. Uh, the second thing is speed. We can't tie up a supercomputer for months at a time to do a, a one project like this. We need a, an efficient method. Next. 
the method that uh, I've tried recently is called orbital free density functional theory. Uh, there's a lot I could say here with the subject of my PhD work, but the main thing in red is that it's a quantum mechanical method that sidesteps the need to use wave functions at all, and in doing so makes uh, very efficient makes for very efficient calculations, up to 10 times or more uh, efficient more efficient geometry optimization. Uh, so far, you know, we've done a lot of the theoretical work to make this random structure searching and, and this new quantum mechanical method work together, and we've uh, come up with some proof of principle results. So. The diagram here shows the results of a lithium search, just a simple lithium metal. The large blue circle marked BCC just means that the BCC structure, the room temperature structure, was discovered most often. But I'll draw your attention to um, and next the uh, darker blue section of this map. And these are all close packed structures. So in fact, lithium takes the FCC structure at very, very low temperatures. And there are many close packed structures that are almost degenerate for lithium. Uh, in the map, there's an FCC structure on one end and an HTTP structure on the other end. But the neat thing is that there are also lots of other stackings that are close packed layers, but in different um, different patterns, some, some of which become quite complex. And the, the method that we are using, structure searching powered by this new orbital free density functional theory, uh, can capture a lot of this variation efficiently. So final slide, please. Uh, the key word in red is efficiency. Structure searching is, is sort of simple but effective, but we need something uh, efficient to be able to do it properly. Now that we have something uh, that's a bit more efficient than what we had before, we're going to look at intermetallic alloys, which are a neat application because they have uh, notoriously complex unit cells, which can make them difficult to, to uh, explore with regular structure searching techniques. Uh, my email's there. Happy to talk uh, about any of this work. Thank you. So thank you very much, Chuck. And thank you to all of the speakers for the session. It's been an absolutely fantastic tour around uh, all the, the different uh, areas of research that are going on. So thank you very much.